Always a privilege to assemble here at Sandyville and worship God in spirit and in truth. It is a sacred blessing where we can come together. We can study from God's word, have a good Bible class, sing these songs of praise to God, edify and build each other up. Appreciate Nolan's prayer mentioning those on foreign fields. Sometimes we forget the battles that they fight just to simply present the gospel. And we continue to pray for those that we support in particular and the work that uh, they're involved in in the saving of souls and preaching the gospel to the world. We've got it made here in more ways than one, unless we forget those that don't have it so well made as we do. Thank you for coming here. We do have a good audience this morning, and it's good to see everyone. Last week, or last weekend, I had the pink eye. This weekend, mad cow. Just kidding. Just kidding. I always thought it was a cow disease. I don't know why that struck me funny. I want to draw your attention this morning to Matthew chapter 25. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 25. We begin, we want to re begin reading, we'll jump right in, reading verse 31. So I hope you go there in your Bibles, Matthew 25, verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him. He will separate from them, them from one another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed of my father. Come, he says, who are blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. As I look at this, it occurs to me that Jesus describes something in this text that, that really just goes to the core of everything that we believe. That as I look at this text, we believe that one day as life as we know it, one day this life is going to come to a screeching halt. That the things that we just get up and take for granted every day, that all of that's going to change one of these days. And, and that with the, the sounding of the trumpet and... We believe that. We believe that this day that is described here, we believe as disciples that this day is going to happen. We believe that Jesus is coming back. And we believe that when Jesus comes back, that every single person that is alive, that every single person that has ever lived will stand and give an account before the great judge. That there will be a judgment day that we're going to have to answer for the, the, the way that we've lived our life. And on that day that there will be eternal consequences. That, that eternal sentences will be given out by the great judge to each and every individual that's ever walked the face of the earth. We believe that. We believe that's going to happen. In fact, I'm suspicious that some of us are here today. Right now because you believe that. That that day is going to happen. That might have been part of your motivation to be here today. And it is part of our motivation for how we're going to live tomorrow and the decisions that we're going to make because, in fact, that day's coming. And we know that. We believe that. And when that day comes, will we hear Jesus say, enter in? 1 Peter chapter 1, if you flip your Bibles over there, Peter talks about the great reward that we anticipate on that day. Notice what he says. Now, in the face of this end, the judgment day, the last day, what we realize is that it's not an end at all. Notice what he says in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. What's our hope? What's our hope based in? The resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed. He says at the last time, Peter says there's our hope. There's a great day that is coming. The judgment day is coming. This is all going to come to an end. But here's what we're hoping for. We look at it. We're going to receive a great inheritance. On that day, our hope is to receive that great inheritance. And, and, and I just look at that, folks. That's the very core of what we believe. That's why we're living the life that we're living. That's why we're following Christ. This is it. This is what it's all about. That day, 
And that hope uh, of that reward, that inheritance that we all long for. So because that is true, the question that I have for you this morning is, if today turned out to be that day, this is the day. And Peter says that it could be today. Because the Lord's going to come as a thief in the night. It could be within the hour. The Lord is coming back. And Peter says we don't know when he's coming back. It could be any time. So, so if it was today, would you go to heaven? If it was today, would you go to heaven? If you face the Lord in the judgment seat right now, today, would you here enter in? You know, I have to tell you that I have been astonished over the years as a preacher when that question has been put out to somebody in, in different situations. If the Lord came today, would you go to heaven? I, I hope so. I hope so. I, I, I think. I think I am. If, if the Lord came today, would you go to heaven? Well, that, that's what I'm striving for. Do you, do you hear the uncertainty in those statements? Do you hear the, the, the uncertainty in those answers? In fact, one lady, we were discussing that about if the Lord came today, would you go to heaven? And she said, don't you think that's a little bit Calvinistic to be confident about that? Is it? Is that Calvinistic to be confident about where we're going when we pass from this life or if the Lord would come right now? Is it Calvinistic to say that I'm going to heaven? I submit to you, brethren, that I think this is more than just an idle curiosity. I'm not sure how one really lives with peace of mind. How do you live with peace of mind if you don't know how all this, if you don't know how all this is going to turn out? How do you have peace of mind if you don't know how all this is going to turn out? I think it impacts our commitment. I think that the way we think about that influences our very life as a Christian. And I think it's a lot of the reason that a lot of brethren live with one foot in the church door and the other foot firmly planted in the world. Because, frankly, they just don't know how this thing's going to turn out. And so they want to get a little bit of both. So can we be confident? Can you be confident about your case on the judgment day? And if we can be, my question is, why aren't we? I want to look at those questions this morning. And really, I just posed that question. I, 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 you know, can, can we be confident? Can we be confident? And if we can be, sort of answer it there, what are some of the things that hinder our confidence about the judgment day? And let's just start with this, though, since we brought it up. Is it Calvinistic to think that way? To, to say that, you know, yes, if the Lord comes today, yes, I'm going to heaven. If the judgment day was today, yes, I'm going to go. Is, is that Calvinistic? Are, are we allowed to say that? Is that right? As a Christian, is that a Bible principle? Is that taught in the Word of God? Are you going to heaven? Yes. Is that in here? Well, John Calvin was a 16th century theologian that impacted the entire denominational world with his precepts and concepts. He wrote a lot about what it was that men would be saved. In fact, his teaching really, I think, continues to have such broad and such an impact on those that are outside the Lord's body. When you talk to people from the denominational world about salvation, very commonly, they're going to bring up some concepts that John Calvin wrote. And one major tenet of Calvinism is the doctrine of preservation of the saints. What that means is that once you're saved, that you're not going to be lost, that there's no way that you can be lost. And, and really, we know it as not the preservation of the saints, but what do we know? We, have, we know it as the doctrine of once saved, always saved. And if you've ever talked to anybody about salvation, what the Bible says about salvation, and the security of the saints, you're going to hear that from somebody in the denominational world. Once you're saved, you're always saved. I think what we don't realize sometimes is how deeply rooted in Calvin's theology uh, a lot of folks are. Calvin believed that, so, uh, that, that salvation was a matter of God's sovereignty. In other words, before he made the world, do you know that he picked out who's going to be saved? And he picked out who's going to be lost. And it didn't matter, it doesn't matter how you live your life, 
that, that you're going to be saved. If you're going to be saved by God's sovereign will, in other words, once you're saved, you see it there? Once God's picked you, and, and it's predetermined in God's mind that you're going to heaven regardless of the life that you live, or you're going to go, be eternally damned to hell regardless of the life you live. Do you see the security there? Do you see that once you're saved, you're always saved? That's the doctrine of Calvinism. But you talk about security and confidence, that'll give it to you, woman. What a doctrine that is. The problem is it's not in the Bible. Now, we could go to a lot of places, but let's go to Hebrews chapter 3. I want you to see where Calvin's teaching conflicts with Bible teaching, all right? Calvin says that once you're saved, you're always saved. Look what the Hebrew writer says, verse 12. Take care, brethren, he says, chapter 3, verse 12, that there not be any of you an evil heart, unbelieving heart, that falls away from the living God. Calvin says you can't be lost, you can't fall away. The Bible says you can fall away, you can be lost. Verse 14, for we have been partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning, he says, of, excuse me, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Well, we've been partakers of that, all right? We want to make sure, or I'm sorry, I wanted to go in verse 13, verse 14, say, but we encourage one another, yes? We can be lost, but you know what? Our part, we need to encourage each other. Listen, there's a possibility you can fall away. We want you to, to know that. We, we're going to do this battle with sin together. So then verse 14, for if we become partakers of Christ, we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Do you see the condition there? You can be lost. We need to encourage each other. What do you need to do? Hold fast that conviction until when? The end. Until it ends. Until your life ends. Until the very end, that conviction that you're going to live the Christian life is there. Now holding fast to that is the condition. So as you look at that, now if there's any doubt more in that, look at chapter 4 verse 1. Therefore, let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. So the Hebrew writer warns that we have this promise, this rest in heaven, but what we read in 1 Peter 1 says there's a danger there. There's a possibility that I might not get that because I might fall away from the living God. So as I look at what Calvin's teaching is, it doesn't match what the Bible says, and anytime somebody's teaching doesn't match what the Bible says, it's false teaching and it's wrong. So when somebody is in conflict with what the Word of God says, Calvin can't be right. Now, a Calvinist could come up to you and say this, well, if your salvation is not secure. If you're saying that there's always this possibility that I can be lost, that I can fall away, really you're just condemning me to a life of doubt. And you're condemning me to a life where I can never be confident as a Christian. Well, I submit to you that that's a false dilemma. I believe the Apostle Paul clearly did not see it that way. While the Bible certainly teaches that a saved person can fall away and be in the state that he is lost, but it also teaches, I believe, that God's people, us, we can be confident. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul's a great example of that. Let's look at the end of the chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's look at verse 26. See what Paul affirms. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself, he says, will not be disqualified. You see what Paul says there? He affirms what the Hebrew writer says. What a terrible tragedy it would be to preach and teach the gospel, to, to help all these folks enter into that rest, that eternal salvation, and then at the end of the race, find myself disqualified. So he was aware of that. Paul first recognized the danger that he could turn from God. And in the end, Paul could be lost, Second Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, even though Paul knows he can turn back and be lost, I want you to see that Paul is very confident about his future. Look at verse 6. 2 Timothy 4 verse 6. For I am ready being poured out, already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, 
There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. If you look at there, isn't that just loaded with doubt? Isn't that text just loaded with doubt? Uh, do you see any? I kind of hope so. I kind of think so. I'm wishing it all works out well for me. Do you see any of that in there? When Paul talks about his future, he says, there is. He will. These are positive statements when Paul talks about his future. He is confident about how things are going to work out when the Lord comes. He's very confident. And I will add, he's not confident because of some false Calvinistic teaching. That's not what gets his confidence. Do you see in this text, in these three verses, why Paul is so confident? I say he's so confident in verse 8 because of what he says in verse 7. Look what he says. I fought a good fight. Are you fighting a good fight? He says, I finished the course. I've kept the faith. Paul was sticking with Jesus Christ all the way to the end. He was going to finish this deal. He was going to finish what he started. He was going to do battle all the way to the end. That's why he could speak with such confidence that God is going to do this and he's confident about his future. There's Paul all the way to the end of the journey. That's why he's confident. I point out too, folks, that it's just not for Paul. We talk about Paul all the time. This isn't just some special deal for an apostle. This isn't just some special deal for Paul. Notice 1 John chapter 2. I believe that God wants all of us to have this blessing. 1 John chapter 2. Notice verse 28. Now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, there's the day. We may have what? Confidence. Confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Brethren, we're exhorted to have confidence when the Lord comes. And for good reason. Turn over a little bit chapter 4, verse 17. By this, what? Love is perfected with us so that we may have what? Confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also we are in this world. How does it make you feel? How does the judgment day make you feel? How does the day make you feel if it was today? Now, you know, as with any great event, I'll tell you what, I think, I think a little bit of nervousness is in order. I, I do. Uh, I think back on, you know, I try to remember when I was the most nervous in my life when I was doing this, and you know when it was? I mean, I, I've been in a lot of situations where I've been beside people that wept like babies and hit their knees because they were that nervous and it didn't affect me. The most nervous I was when I got married. That was it. It wasn't because I, I knew I had the right one, but I don't know what that day did to me. I couldn't hardly, it, it, I was nervous. That was it. So, so with any great event, and the judgment day is the greatest event yet to happen, and it's going to happen, there, there's a little bit of nervousness there. There's, there's no doubt about that. But do you feel terror when you think about that day? Do you feel a, a fear that consumes you? Is, is that what you feel? That's not what God wants for us. In fact, when you think about that day, God just wants the opposite. Just with the passages that we just read, he wants us to have confidence in the face of the judgment day. 1 John chapter 5, look at verse 13. John says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may what? Know. That you may know that you have eternal life. Oh, I hope so what I'm working for. It's what I'm striving for. You can know that. John's very clear about that, and I think we could just read that verse, first verse, and answer our first question right off the bat at that God wants us to be confident on Judgment Day. Here it is. We can know. We can have that confidence. And I, and I think as you look at that, I think, well, if that's true, if that's true, if these statements are true, and if it's a Bible print, why aren't we confident? Why aren't we confident? Well, I'm going to say one word, the devil. That's the answer to that. Now I can say, let's get a songbook and the invitation. I've answered the question. Now, it's not, not that easy. But I'm very serious when I say the reason that we're not confident is because Satan, because I think he understands, and I think he knows the impact of a lack of confidence that it has on ourselves. 
And, and I think that what he wants to do is get into your head and get into your mind, and he wants to plant these seeds of doubt, and we won't have confidence. And in not having confidence and knowing that, it's going to impact your peace. And it's going to impact your confidence about the day to come, and it's going to impact your commitment as you live the life of a Christian. Satan is at work. Why do you lack confidence? The scripture is very plain that we need to have the confidence. Why is that lacking? Well, how about this? One of the things that I think will steal your confidence more than ever is when there is willful sin in your life. Think about that. You know, we cannot be happy about the future. We can't be happy about the day to come if there is willful sin in our life. If you're practicing sin, and, and again, all sin's willful, yes, but a willful sin in this category is a sin that you refuse to repent. It's a, a, a sin that you refuse to acknowledge. It's a sin that you refuse to ask forgiveness for. It's your life. This is how you are. I'm involved in this. I'm going to keep being involved in this. And I don't care what God's word says. This is what I'm going to... And you make that choice of willful sin. And when you're living that way, I'm going to tell you something. It's not happy times, is it? It's not a good life. Sometimes there are secret sin. Nobody else knows about them. What's going on in your house? With your wife, with your husband? And the relationship that you have, you know that it does not honor God. It does not honor God. And, that, and, and really, what's, that's against His will. And that's sinful. Maybe there's some wickedness happening in your home and your relationship with your spouse and you know it. Maybe there's a private addiction. A private addiction to pornography. A private addiction to prescription drugs. A private addiction to adultery. All of those things, all of those things are still willful sin. It's a life that you're living, whether in secret or in public, it's willful sin. And you're doing that. Things aren't right with God. When you think about God coming back, how in the world, if you're living that way, how can you have any peace? The Hebrew writer says, what a fearful thing it is. For the sinner, the sinner, the willful sinner to fall in the hands of the living God. No wonder the willful sinner is not looking forward to the judgment day and doesn't feel good about the future. He knows he's living the wrong way. You know, going back to 2 Timothy 4, look at those things that gave Paul confidence. And I look at those things, and if I'm looking for peace and, and confidence in my future, and at the same time living a life of sin, give it up. Stop. Repent. It doesn't work. Willful sin will always rob you of the peace of mind that the judgment day should bring. Sometimes, sometimes we don't have confidence about our future. You know why? Because you shouldn't with the way you're living. Things aren't right with God. That's why. Well, there's another reason why we are robbed of our confidence. And I believe that some of us believe that in order to go to heaven, you must be perfect. You know, the problem is not willful sin, but it's a concern over the fact that sometimes we just don't always execute the Christian life as we should, perfectly. You know, maybe I'm trying to serve God, and I really want to serve God. And I really want to do... Uh, my best and be devoted to him but frankly when I run the race you know what I do I trip I fall I stumble a lot I do maybe maybe sometimes I stumble big time now can you think back again I bring up the new Christian but think about the new Christian who probably didn't know much Bible just the first principles and they obeyed the gospel and they begin to study God's word and look into God's word and, and they, they see some things that, that man I, I'm doing that wrong I I need to stop that. And you can call whatever it is some things that, that you were doing that are inappropriate that you need to stop and you dig in a little bit more and, and you say, well, that's wrong. I do that all the time at work. I need to stop doing that. And you're always finding new things that apply to your life that you need to make changes in your life or, or new things that says, I need to stop doing that or I need to start doing that. And you're doing all of that. How can you be confident when you're doing that all the time, how, how can you be confident? And it isn't just a struggle for new Christians. 
I think people who are even seasoned disciples, we have those weaknesses, don't we? We've been doing it for a long time. Sometimes those same weaknesses, what do they do? They pop up again and again and again and again. And today I'm asking God for forgiveness for what I did yesterday, the day before, an hour before. And I think about that. In our hearts we wonder, does God ever get tired of this? Did he ever get tired of this? Here it is, I, I'm, I, enough. How many chances I'm going to give you? No, he doesn't. I can affirm that he does not. But it sure is hard to be confident about your salvation when we continue to make those mistakes, doesn't it? So let me say something about that. Number one, I want to remind you that nobody executes the Christian life perfectly. Nobody. Nobody ever has. I did not say that it was all right to sin. All right? That's another lesson. Did you hear me? Are we on the same page with that? Nobody does it perfectly. It is not okay to sin. But we will sin. Nobody does this perfectly. One example I used about a month ago, Galatians 2. Paul, you think he's a seasoned Christian? An apostle? There he is, Galatians 2. Anybody that ought to know about Gentiles ought to be Peter. Well, there he is. He pulls away. After Acts 10, you'd think Peter had it figured out. He's intimidated by some people that come down from Jerusalem. He withdraws himself from the Gentiles. Paul calls him on it. It's an ugly scene. All right. What in the world? Reading that and looking at that and looking at Peter's history. How in the world did he do that? I would suggest that even people who have been Christians for decades will continue to find areas in their life where they must change. And they need to change. This is one of the amazing things about the Bible. We always say it in class, well, we'll never know everything in there. And we'll never. That's right, you won't. And when you see something in there, change. Make the change. That's what the study's about. Things where, where I'm challenged to do better, to think better, to mold myself into the image of Christ. That's what it's about. So if being at peace about the future is dependent on you getting some place in your life where you do it perfectly, you can stop today because it's not going to happen. I don't think it's an issue whether or not we're going to fail. Folks, we're going to fail. It's the issue of what we do when we fail. That's the point. That's the issue. It is that when we, we find out something that we're doing wrong, Thinking wrong, being wrong, when we look at that, God wants us to, to recognize that some, in, in that facet of our life to change, to repent, to stop, to do better. Now, you take somebody that doesn't do that, realizes that, won't change, then we're back to person one. That's willful sin. When you actually see something that you need to do and you refuse to do it, that's willful sin. That's a whole other matter. If you keep on doing something that you know is wrong, you back up. But you know what? There's another way. First John. First John chapter 1, verse 9. I want you to notice what happens to the Christian. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. Now look what happens. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When I mess up, I beg God to forgive me and I ask God to forgive me, and I repent of my sins, He washes me. You see the reference there? He cleanses me. It's just like the day I come up out of this water. I'm perfect. I'm new. I've been forgiven. I'm whole. There's no doubt about it. If I do this, God's going to do this. He's going to make my life perfect. When the process is going on, I'm learning. I'm growing. I'm developing. Sometimes that means identifying failures. Sometimes that means identifying your own sins, shortcomings in your life. When you're doing that and you're studying that and you're trying to better yourself in all of those areas as a Christian, when you're doing that, folks, we can be confident about where we stand with God. That's what this passage says. We can be confident about the future. We can be confident about tomorrow because the simple fact of it is all of us must and should live this way as a Christian. There's no other way. This is it. This is the principle that's taught here. 
I don't see any other way to live but except what John says to live as a Christian. Number one, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to sin. What do I do? Repent. Ask God to forgive you. You're cleansed. You're washed. You're perfect. That's what he teaches. Are you doing that? Let's not be robbed of our confidence because we make mistakes. And we sin. Everybody does. The Lord gives us a way in our life to deal with that. And when we do, he forgives us of our sins. And in that, we know we can be confident. But for some people, it's not about the sin that they know and dealing with that robs them of their confidence. For some, I think it's about the sin that they don't know. It's about the sin that you don't know about. What if I'm failing in my life in some place that I don't even perceive, that I don't even recognize? What if I've missed something? What if there's a principle in Scripture that needs application to my life that I just totally don't see it, or I just totally don't get it? What are we going to do about that? Let me concur that being a disciple is a never-ending process of learning and growing. We teach that. That's the truth. Now, if that is true, how are you ever going to have confidence then? I'm always learning. I'm always growing. I'm always falling. I'm always getting up. How can we have confidence in our life like that? I want to say two things about that. The first thing is that you better make sure that you are learning and growing. That's the first point in learning and growing. That you are learning and growing. That's, that's the point in that. That's what the process involves. That constant look toward God. That constant look toward the will of God. That constant, I'm going to change my will to His will. That's it. That submission, that humility, that that confidence in God's way is better than my way. And when I see it, I'm going to change. Are we constantly looking? Are we constantly striving that way? I'll tell you what, when you're not, you better be concerned because you can't be as confident about your future as I can. The second thing I would suggest to you is that, I'll tell you what, you take that to God. Think about that. Psalms, chapter 19. We talk, to about, we talk to God about the sins that we don't see. Look what he says in verse 12. He says, who can discern his errors? Who can? Acquit me of hidden faults, he says. <laughs> what I need to do is pray about the things that I don't see. You ever think about it? I need to be honest with God. and Maybe there are some things that I'm not that he wants. And I want to. So, God help me in that. Help me to see the things that I don't see. Help me to be the person. Help me to see what's missing in your will. Listen, God's for us in that process. You can be confident in that. And let me say all of that, folks. God wants us to go to heaven. He's our kind, loving, heavenly Father that has done everything in the world so that you will go to heaven, so that you're going to make it. And when we stumble, folks, God is eager to forgive. He loves you. He wants to guide us. He wants us to understand His will. He wants us to be like His Son. He's for us. We need to seek to know and understand His will and even for Him to help us know the things that we don't know. All kinds of things out there that will shake your confidence about your future. The issue is not the issue is not whether God will stay with you till the end. That's not the issue. The issue and the question is whether or not you will stay with God till the end. That's the question. That's the issue. It is if, is, is he with me? Yes. Am I with him? Yes. Be confident about the judgment day. God's with me. I know he is. I'm with God. I know I am. Let the horn blow. Let's do this. Be confident about that day. Does the question we started with today really bother you? If the Lord would come today, would you go to heaven? If the answer is no, do you know that you can make that right today with total confidence that God will forgive you of your sins and that you can go to heaven? And that you can fall and get up and you can grow and change and develop 
and God will be with you every step of the way. Do you know that you can have confidence in that? And do you know that if you strive to the end in doing that and living that kind of life and not give up, that you're going to go to heaven? Do you know that's what the Bible says? Oh, folks, where is the peace in that? Where's the peace of mind in that? Where's the confidence in that? Brethren, if you don't know how all this is going to turn out, you live a miserable life as a Christian. Know how this is going to turn out. We're not wasting our time. It's not an in and out thing. Know the truth. I'm going to heaven. And I know that I'm going to heaven. Because I know that God is with me. And I know that I'm with God. Clear to the end. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned to an eternal hell. That's the gospel. You can be confident in that. If you've not done that, you can be confident that you are lost. Outside of Christ, you can be confident if you don't respond to the gospel of Christ that you will be lost. If you've done that and you've strayed away and the answer to the question is no for you because of sin in your life, you need the prayers of this congregation Brethren, come forward. We'll pray with you. God will forgive you and cleanse you just like the day you were born again. Please come as together we stand and sing.